next slide we can see your slides we can see the uh, powerpoint presentation but it's not full no, screen but, uh, no but i mean changing the slides can you see the let me maybe share my entire screen up. So can you see it in full screen mode now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, Shrey, uh, would you like to introduce our speaker today? Yeah, sure, sure. So, uh, Mr. Pratik Jain uh, leads the machine learning and foundations and optimizations team at Google AI, and <clears throat> his research and in, uh, interests include machine learning non convex optimization statistics in general and uh, he's uh, he's also interested in uh, machine uh, ap applications of machine learning to privacy computer vision text miner mining and nlp so and he has also submitted his work to uh, esteemed journals uh, such as nips uh, iclr icml so yeah we are very glad to have you uh, with us today sir so uh, now i'll uh, hand over to you uh, with your talk Thank you. Um, thanks so much. Um, thanks a lot for inviting me and uh, uh, coming to this talk on Friday evening. Um, so, like you know, as we discussed earlier, like uh, like I would love for this talk to be uh, interactive. Um, I don't really have a fixed set of materials that I want to cover here, and um, like you know, the goal of this talk is just to sort of uh, tell you about uh, one direction of research that uh, that me and some of my Colleagues uh, have been very sort of excited about for last four or five years. So I just want to share that excitement and tell you about some of the problems uh, that can be solved. And uh, there are very sort of interesting opportunities here. So I would love, like, you know, if you want to sort of dig deeper into it, um, like, feel free to look at some of our papers. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me as well. Right? So let's just keep it completely interactive. So. <clears throat> Uh, so today, like, you know, we are living in a truly digital world where we have devices all around us, right? And now pretty much everybody on Earth, as well as maybe even on Mars, uh, people know that uh, we can make all these devices much more capable by uh, introducing machine learning or artificial intelligence. Into them. So let's look at, uh, like, you know, um, how, where things stand right now with, with uh, inducing machine learning or AI capabilities into certain devices. So on the leftmost side, we have uh, these very powerful cloud as well as PC class devices where we can train biggest of the models and we can deploy them. Again, there are a lot of, uh, like, uh, you might have to worry about a lot of uh, optimization, etc. when you want to deploy these large models, but it's still, like, these power, these devices now are so powerful that for most practical purposes, we can, like, you know, deploy almost any, like, strong, very, very large model here. But uh, things get interesting, like, as we go towards right of this computer spectrum. So we, as we go towards right of this computer spectrum, we hit what we call large edge devices. So these large edge devices are uh, what you would think of as your uh, mobile phone or uh, your smart watch um, or maybe some of your smart speakers, right? So these edge devices will have a reasonable amount of memory. So let's say 128 megabyte or say even one gigabyte of memory. They will have a decent uh, processor also. But they're still not as powerful, as capable as a cloud or PC device, which means that training models on these devices in general is uh, almost a no-no. But also for inference or for deployment of models, you might not be able to use your full-blown models here. You might have to worry about compressing the models a little bit, maybe cut down some layers in your neural network or quantize your neural network, compress them somehow so that they can run on these large devices. Right? And this is where most of the industry is focusing right now with respect to devices and AI. That is most of the frameworks that we have, the most of the um, like you know uh, real world deployments that are happening are happening in this space. But the interesting part is that even beyond this large edge devices, 
there is a large spectrum of devices that we call tiny edge right um, so these tiny edge devices are your typical say microcontrollers uh, that are attached to your sensors right so and they can they are like battery powered devices they are very cheap they are very small in form factor which means that they can be put in your uh, uh, fridge in your tv in your uh, microwave or in your uh, led lights or in your shoes in your clothes so now these devices are going places like they are being instrumented pretty much every walk of the life and uh, and uh, and because like you know they are closest to the data they are looking at the data at the highest fidelity so if we can uh, make these devices intelligent then we can potentially sort of you know solve uh, some very interesting new problems some very interesting new scenarios um, uh, can open up for example let's say if we can have a very tiny camera attached to a white cane uh, then you know like uh, the people with uh, some sort of visual impairment they might be able to use it in a very strong manner to ensure that they are not uh, bumping into somebody else or if there is some car coming at very high speed they can sort of side track it so a lot of the, those things can happen if we can enable uh, machine learning or intelligence on these tiny devices so so come so the industry is very cognizant of this space because the volume in this space is really large that is uh, uh, the number of such microcontrollers that are being sold uh, each year is increasing heavily and i think uh, last year some 30 billion dollar worth of microcontrollers were sold and the number is just increasing right and because of this internet of devices uh, or internet of things uh, um, uh, Uh, revolution as well as medical internet of things um, revolution it seems like that these uh, these devices will be occupying big part of our life like a day to day life right so uh, so so yeah like making them intelligent is important now how do you go about it so one approach that uh, that is being taken right now is that we treat as these uh, these microcontrollers and these sensors as just dumb devices we just collect data from them and we send it to the cloud or some other pc class device or some gateway device and those gateway devices will then run say machine learning algorithms they will run say the inference of these machine learning models and then send that information back so for example if you have a say a security camera around your house uh, it takes a picture it sends that picture back to to the uh, to some gateway device Uh, which is much more powerful let's say and that gateway device this then uh, analyzes this picture and says that oh uh, in this uh, picture uh, there is maybe some intruder or this some anomaly and raises an alarm right so so this this is the type of mechanism that most of the time people are using right now and that's a perfectly fine architecture in certain cases but there are several settings where this architecture might not be enough uh, that is in those settings um, like you know due to certain constraints that are put because of the scenario and because of the uh, compute capability of these devices we just cannot sort of send all the data to cloud at home that cloud will run intelligence uh, there we would want these devices to be natively intelligent that is these devices should be running machine learning inference at least natively uh, like the locally um, completely without uh, relying on cloud too much right so any questions so far uh-huh. all right so let's make this sort of discussion little bit more concrete so first of all like just to sort of give you a little bit more context let's discuss about what type of devices are we really talking about why do we really care about these devices and uh, finally like you know we'll talk about how can we really hope to enable machine learning on these devices so as i mentioned that like you know there is a big sort of spectrum of devices in this what we call tiny edge world and um, there are like you know uh, devices which are somewhat powerful all the way to devices like this uh, m0 plus class processor which has just 48 megahertz processor uh, just 2 kilobyte of ram and 32 kilobyte read only flash right so really really tiny devices you can get uh, but they are like very battery efficient they can be really really tiny in terms of form factor so for example just to give you context here is the device uh, right and this is a golf ball so you can imagine how small these devices can be in fact people are now thinking of uh, sort of you know ingesting these devices and doing some bit of analysis in your body with these devices and what right um 
<laughs> so so this is like type of devices we are talking about but now why do we really um care about these devices and why do we want to make them natively intelligent well as i mentioned that these devices are being deployed all around us they are sort of now you know, going to be present in every walk of our life and uh, the reason to make machine learning available on these devices natively is because in most of these settings uh in most of these devices there is one sort of overriding principle which is that communication is going to be much more expensive than computation right okay. note that here i have not i just said expensive but expensive in what terms i have not sort of told you that uh this expense can come in terms of the cost of the device uh, or cost of like you know just connecting to the cloud and sending the data to cloud this cost can come uh, in terms of the latency that you have to incur in giving uh, giving uh, giving your machine learning inference uh, results the cost can come in terms of uh, the bandwidth you sort of utilize here uh, in terms of like your internet bandwidth the cost can come uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the battery that you consume right and then finally one of the most critical aspect is that the cost can turn in terms of the privacy right that is if you are communicating all your data to the cloud then you might be violating privacy in such a heavy manner that it, it might not be good that is you don't probably want your security camera to take these pictures send this data over unsecured network and send upload it to cloud like that uh, that would be pretty spooky and that could, could be very dangerous in general so because of those reasons you would want to sort of run machine learning natively on these devices let me give make it a little bit more concrete by giving some examples <laughs> so for example like you know one of the biggest uh, <clears throat> sort of uh, area where this revolution is coming is in wellness centric wearables right so you have your smart watches but then now you have uh, very fancy sort of um, hearing aids you in fact have very fancy uh, uh, hearing buds also like uh, just like you know, yeah uh, earbuds as well uh, then like you know as i mentioned like you know in walking sticks uh, for uh, old people or for people with visual impairments so there are variety of these wellness centric wearables that are coming up and in all those situations like privacy is one of the biggest concern right that is you don't want to send uh, the data like for example a hearing aid is listening to all things that you are listening you don't want to send that data or unsecured network to some cloud or even a gateway device uh, battery is another big big concern here that is all these health wellness and uh, variables will be sort of uh, battery powered and uh, it's well known that if you are sending data uh, right if you are communicating then the battery consumed by these devices can be uh, 10 to 100 times more than doing that compute that much amount compute locally right and then finally latency can also be very critical in many of these settings where like you know sending data to some gateway device or cloud and then getting the inference and getting it back might take so long that like you know it might be too late for you right uh, just to give you a example in this battery setting so for example now people are trying out uh, uh like you know insertion of some sort of <coughs> electrodes or some sort of like chips in uh, in brain right and what is the advantage of that well let's say uh, somebody uh, is suffering from seizure right so a seizure so even before uh, the person sort of suffers from it uh, if <coughs> our um, uh, machine learning algorithm that is running on that chip can detect that oh, there is some anomalous uh, activity going on here like because like brain is what like a bunch of signals that is coming through so if like you see that the signal activity is not uh, working properly as uh, like normal there is some anomaly going on here then maybe the algorithm should say oh you like you know you might be suffering seizure and if you are driving the car then you should just you know uh, just stop the car on the side of the road and uh, all the decision will need to be made in like you know few milliseconds you cannot sort of wait for sending that data to cloud and then getting the inference and then getting it back and like wasting few precious seconds there so it's very, it can be very critical right Uh, another setting for uh, where like uh, such a thing can be very interesting is say smart forms right that is now in these forms you have a bunch of sensors like there are soil sen- soil moisture sensors soil makeup sensors um, then there are like you know <clears throat> these devices to monitor how uh, the insects are there 
so they are uh, how the atmosphere is so there are variety of uh, these sensors that you can instrument your farm with and these farms tend to be in remote location you cannot probably hope to send all the data to cloud or to gateway devices you would probably want to sort of you know uh, conserve bandwidth and do a lot of this processing locally and just send very small amount of information uh, over to the cloud network Right. Then in smart city, smart meters, uh, 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 like setting again, there are a lot of reasons like battery cost because of which you would want to make these uh, these uh, devices more uh, intelligent. Then in sports, there is again a lot of uh, interest in sort of um, in, uh, in making these uh, devices intelligent. That is now a lot of sports equipment are equipped with the sensors and microcontrollers and again you would want these sensors to be intelligent uh, rather than sort of again sending all the data to cloud and wasting a lot of battery then smart factory very very critical scenario factories are now equipped uh, with a lot of sensors and again you would want to make those sensors more intelligent so that you do not consume a lot of battery you do not consume a lot of bandwidth and finally in our houses in smart in appliances we again want them to be much more sort of uh, uh, intelligent so for example let's say if you have a uh, if you if you have lights in your house and you rather than standing up and like you know switching on and off you want to make people even more lazy so uh, like if the person just says that oh like you know uh, bedroom lights off then it should just turn off and rather than relying on some external entity like alexa which takes is this data sends it to cloud and can sort of you know uh, violate the privacy you would want all that processing to happen locally on your device and hopefully with like a device which is like say just uh one dollar or two dollar uh, worth of cost rather than hundreds of dollars right so there are a lot of settings where such devices are important and we would want to sort of uh, enable machine learning uh, and intelligence on them and anyways one side effect of doing this research is that uh, like if you are able to come up with solid machine learning algorithms that are natively efficient that are natively sort of you know cheap then they can use even in your gateway devices your pc devices your cloud and make the cost of uh, inference even on those devices to be smaller which means that it can sort of you know help conserve energy which can uh, help bring down your cloud cost significantly so a variety of sort of uh, those goodness also comes in even if you do not care for this tiny devices right so now uh, one might say that i am talking about like you know cost uh, of uh, models what does it really mean like uh, is there a fixed notion of how we measure the cost of a model so again the the cost of a model can be measured in a variety of settings right so for example uh, uh, you can measure the cost of a model in terms of the number of parameters it has that is the model size uh, that you have based on that you can measure the cost and typically what you would do is uh, you will plot uh models along the this uh, x-axis where x-axis is the number of parameters and you want to see how the accuracy of this model sort of changes uh, as you supply more and more parameters and in general you would want to be close to the top of this curve uh, right uh, similarly like you can measure the cost in terms of computation that is how many operations your model needs to do per inference to uh, uh, right, uh, to, to give out the final prediction and here again you would want to sort of uh, have a model uh, or range of models which can do pretty well across the spectrum that is for a large sort of portion of compute spectrum uh, your accuracy should be uh, should be sort of you know close to the top Similarly, the peak memory used used by the model. Note that this is completely different than the number of parameters that the model needs. Right? That the number of parameters is how many parameters I have, right? But peak memory usage can be very different. That is, even though model might have say 100 parameters only, but uh, because it is applying a convolution in intermediate stages, it might sort of uh, have intermediate activation maps so large that it might not fit in your device. So peak memory usage can be also a very critical aspect. And finally, like the energy that you need to uh, that you need to consume per inference, that's another sort of critical aspect that you will need to worry about. Uh, so your your cost can be measured along any of these parameters, and uh, and based on your setting, based on your uh, problem, based on the device that you're looking at, based on your scenario, you might have to do trade off between these various parameters, and you might say that oh, this parameter is really critical. I cannot exceed this much, whereas in these other parameters, I'll just try to optimize the model. 
Uh, okay, so in general, as I said that, like, you know, if you want to deploy machine learning or microcontrollers, you need to worry about all these four fronts. And here that also means that how do you deploy your solution? Uh, that also becomes quite critical. That is, uh, you do not have a, like, you know, uh, operating system running on your device anymore. Like you have a microcontroller which has six, or two kilobytes or 16 kilobytes or even 256 kilobytes of RAM. So it does not have a Windows or Linux running on it. It is, it is a bare metal uh, situation in which case, how do you even take your code and run on this device? That also becomes quite a challenge. In fact, there are a lot of companies who are sort of investing in this direction. Google has a, a technique uh, as a sort of uh, platform that's called uh, TensorFlow Lite Micro. Uh, at Microsoft, we were working on something called ELL. STM has something called Cube.ai. Similarly, like a lot of chip companies have various sort of platforms to help ensure that whatever ML model you come up with can be deployed with ease on these tiny devices and also ensure that the deployment part does not cost you significantly in terms of computer memory usage. <clears throat> so again, any questions so far? Is anybody even listening to me? Can you confirm that? Yeah, yeah, we're able to okay. hear you. Um, there's okay. no questions as of now. Okay, okay. Um, all right, so how do we, so like, let's come to the final part probably, which is uh, the most technical part, which is that how do we really uh, enable machine learning on these tiny devices, right? So there are multiple of approaches that, uh, that, um, that the researchers and engineers in the community are taking here. So one approach is to take existing architecture and just compress it, right? And by that, what I mean is that, you know, you uh, take your architecture, let's say if it was running on floating points, uh, was using say 64 bits or 32 bits, you just compress it to use say one bit or two bits or something like that, right? Or you decrease the number of layers, you do some sort of pruning, a variety of those approaches. Uh, another approach is to search for better architecture. That is, let's say if you have some standard cloud architecture, it might waste a lot of parameters and a lot of compute unnecessarily. So you would want to search for the precise number of uh, channels that I need in, let's say, my convolution architecture or precise number of hidden units that I need in my feed forward layer to, to ensure that I'm using the minimum amount of compute uh, that I need while still ensuring that my accuracy is good, my accuracy is solid. Right? So these two techniques are not trying to come up with completely new architectures or anything. <coughs> they takes the existing technology that we have for standard models and just trying to sort of, you know, compress it and make it smaller uh, so as to suit these tiny devices. And while these techniques are very useful, very powerful, very successful, but they have their limitation, right? Because these architectures were not designed with uh, these tiny devices as being uh, as being the primary target, right? Which means that they can be natively fairly large. They might be natively wasting a lot of resources and parameters that you would not be able to recover. So another approach is to design new architectures, new neural network blocks precisely for these tiny devices. And Can that's question, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, Abhilash asks, can we mm -hmm. use knowledge distillation? Yes, so knowledge distillation, I would put in uh, uh, like, you know, in one of these two categories. That is, you can say that it is like a searching better architecture or you can say that compressing existing architecture. It's, it's in similar category, right? That is, you are not changing the architecture in any fundamental manner. You are still using your standard uh, convolution layers or uh, like your standard, say, uh, mobile net blocks or ResNet blocks in computer vision or uh, your LSTM uh, blocks in, say, speech. So you'll be using similar blocks. It's just that you will try to use smaller blocks and do some bit of knowledge distribution. And as I said, that, that certainly helps but it takes you only some up to some extent, like it will give you maybe 50% reduction or so. But if you really want to take very powerful models and put them on tiny devices, you might need like a 100x reduction or so in terms of compute requirement or size. And that is a much more challenging problem, right? Uh, so there, that's where what we are proposing is that you should try to design completely new architectures or new neural network blocks for these tiny devices, right? And that's where there has been a lot of work, uh, right? So for example, networks like SqueezeNet, MobileNet, 
uh, for computer vision are sort of geared somewhat uh, to that. And then uh, as part of uh, this work at Microsoft that I was doing, uh, we were sort of working on a library called EdgeML, where again, uh, the idea was to come up with completely new architectures or completely new neural network blocks that can be used to replace existing neural network blocks and make them natively cheap. So I'll make it more concrete in the next few slides. Uh, by the way, I should make a point there that, like you know, because these devices are so constrained, uh, if you like really want to get the maximum juice out of it, you will need to use all these techniques together. You cannot sort of rely on one technique uh, at a time. You will need to uh, use natively small blocks. You will need to further compress them using pruning and quantization. And you will also need to search for the best parameters there by using some uh, searching, uh, like, you know, better architecture, like uh, this uh, auto ML type of techniques to ensure that, like, you know, we are in really, really small regime. So, uh, so as part of this HTML project, we came up with the, like, you know, a sort of entirely new building blocks for a lot of uh, uh, standard neural network uh, blocks. So, for example, uh, if you are using, say, standard feed for layer in your neural network, right? Or if you're not using neural network, you're using some standard gradient booster decision trees or support vector machines, like under support vector machines. So, rather than using uh, those, you can uh, try to use these new methods that we have called bonsai and proton. Uh, by the way, these are not new anymore. Like these are four, five year fairly well established method. But, but yeah, so these methods can be. You know, used to sort of replace these uh, much more expensive versions like multiple uh, layer perceptron or gradient booster decision trees. And um, they you can show that they are like, you know, significantly more cheap in terms of compute as well as peak memory usage uh, while still maintaining accuracy. Uh, now, if you are interested in, say, using LSTM or GRU type of architectures, basically recurrent neural network architectures, especially in a streaming data like uh, one that happens in speech data, there you can use techniques like EMI RNN, fast GRNN, and SH RNN uh, that we come up with. So, again, these are sort of natively new building blocks that you can use uh, instead of your standard LST GRM type of techniques. And then finally, if you are using your standard computer vision architectures, like you know, taking convolutions plus some sort of max average pooling, you can replace a fair bit of that by using a new pooling layer that we have that we call RNN pool. Right. So in this talk, I will not really have time to go in detail of all these. I will very briefly talk about Proton. Uh, so not Proton. I will very briefly talk about fast GRNN, and then I'll focus most of the remaining talk on uh, this technique that we call RNN pool. Right. So, but like, you know, just to give you an idea of uh, what, say, these techniques like Proton can do, let me, Bonsai can do, let me just give uh, some, like, you know, competitive numbers. So here, what we did was we took our techniques, Bonsai and Proton, we restricted them to take less than 16 kilobyte of track. Right. And then we, uh, or the model size is restricted to 16 kilobytes, right? And then we now go and measure uh, the accuracy of these methods against some standard uncompressed methods. So, for example, your standard gradient booster decision tree or multi layer perceptron or your kernel support vector machine or your KDS neighbors. Right. So here on the top, we observe that on a variety of these benchmarks. Here we have presented only four benchmarks, but we tried our method on some, I think, 12 benchmarks or so. And, you know, each of these benchmarks, we observe similar thing. That is, uh, Bonsai and Proton is able to get accuracy, which is very similar to your standard uncompressed methods. Right. But when you look at the model size, these methods are restricted to about 16 kilobyte of RAM, whereas your gradient boosted decision trees or neural networks, they can take uh, like, you know, megabytes or even half a gigabyte of RAM, which means that we can provide you 1000x or even 10,000x compression without any loss in accuracy or with a very small amount of loss in accuracy. Right. And similarly, like, you know, you can sort of say that, oh, let me now compare against uh, sort of more uh, like methods that are more suited in this regime, which is like methods that are suited for small, uh, small model regime. So there again, we compare against our bonsai proton method against a variety of methods in this regime, like budget ARA, prune ARA. These are like many of these methods were well established. They were sort of award winning works. Um, and what we observed was that in really low model regime, that is when we want to look at models of the size, say, 0 to 16 kilobyte, uh, our methods were significantly more accurate than any of these existing methods. Like they were 10 to 15 percent more accurate. Right. All right. So this is just to sort of give a high level bit on if you have 
uh, say some annoying feed forward layers or annoying gradient booster decision trees, which are very expensive that you are not able to sort of uh, use for your application, then you can try out uh, Proton or Bonsai, and it uh, they should give you a significant amount of saving right up. All right, so let's talk about the second building block, which is fast GRNN. Uh, so. quickly sort of uh, describe what a recurrent neural network is so so suppose uh, so recurrent neural network is essentially a stateful uh, neural network right so suppose you have some audio data suppose you are trying to process uh, some audio data that contained a cortana so it has a cortana suppose and this is how i tokenize suppose right uh, this is all made up this is not how exactly it will go but suppose i sort of made it up like this so now what we do is like uh, this recurrent neural network will start with some initial state at zero it will take this input hey and it will apply some sort of transformations here and it will get a state uh, current state of the uh, of of the data that is it has essentially sort of saying that oh i have processed hey and this is my current state and then it sort of takes core. It says that ah, earlier I had heard hey, now I take core also. Uh, it's a sequential type of thing. And then I, I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, and then I sort of uh, process that to say that I uh, like I have a new state here. Then again I apply uh, my like take the latest hidden state. I apply the latest data point, and again I refine the hidden state. And this final hidden state that I obtain that can be thought of as a feature vector that summarizes the entire sequential input data that I gave. That is this hey quota now, which is a sequential data. Uh, this sort of final state is able to summarize this entire. And now on top of this, you can maybe apply your classifier to see whether uh, whether hey Kotana was present in this snippet of audio or not. So this classifier can be whatever you want. It can be your logistic regression. It can be your multi-layer perceptron. It can be your bonsai. It can be proton. If you are interested in making this uh, part to be. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Akash again asks, what what makes the compressed models better while consuming less memory? What are the things they are learning that uncompressed neural nets can't? Okay, uh, I am not sure if I ever sort of claimed that compressed. regularization like for example sparsity of the model is known to be a regularization in its own so that's why it might be able to do slightly better that is avoid overfitting but in general i don't think we are claiming that they are better it's just that in a variety of settings which might not be very hard in those settings uh, your standard uh, methods like a gradient booster decision tree or multi-layer perceptron might be wasting a lot of resources might be wasting a lot of parameters that you need don't need to and by designing these methods that are like you know designed for these tiny devices that are sort of very cognizant of uh, of the model size or the compute um, constraints because of those like we are able to train significantly better models uh, does that clarify the question Yeah, he says. Thanks. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, all right, so uh, as yeah. you were, yeah. Uh, okay, so as you were discussing that um, we uh, <clears throat> like you know the hidden state is updated by applying some sort of transformation to the current state of the system and the new data point that we get. So in a standard recurrent neural network, the the model is very simple. You take your current state, you apply a linear transformation u to it. You can take your current data point, like for example, this is my data point. I apply this transformation to it. I add some bias, and then I apply some sort of nonlinearity. So maybe I apply a uh, ten hyperbolic nonlinearity or some ReLU or some some, some standard nonlinearity, and that gives me a new state. And I just keep on modifying my state like this to get this final feature vector. 
So extremely simple idea seems quite powerful, but unfortunately in practice, this idea does not work because training these recurrent neural networks is uh, quite unstable in practice. Uh, people very routinely observe exploding or vanishing gradients. And the reason therefore that is also very simple. Like the reason is the following that in a lot of these applications, the total length of the input that is like, you know, at each time step, we are getting some, uh, some input data, right? So the total length of this input data in, especially like in uh, tiny devices type of settings can be quite large. It can be say in the order of hundred, right? Which means that when you look at this uh, matrix U and say it's singular values, uh, even if the singular values are um, or eigenvalues are like, you know, uh, say slightly off from one, say one eigenvalue is two, one eigenvalue is half. That means that uh, because I'm applying this U matrix again and again to my hidden states to get this final thing. So when I take a derivative with respect to U, because I applied U hundred times, that is I had in some sense a U to the power hundred term. So when I differentiate it, I will get a term like U to the power 99, right? And that means that uh, if one eigenvalue is two, then that u to the power 99 will mean that uh, in the gradient, one eigen direction will be will have value which is two to the power 99. And another, and there will be some eigenvalue which will be at a scale of say half. So we'll have half to the power 99. And that means that in some direction, the gradient completely vanishes. So in some direction, it is just exploding. In some direction, it is completely vanishing. And because of that, it's extremely difficult to train these neural networks, like recurrent neural network as it is. And people are not able to train them. So people have some fixes here. Uh, one sort of, you know, standard fix is, uh, is to do what's called uh, gated recurrent neural networks, which is, and like the shining examples, there are LSTMs and GRUs. So LSTMs and GRUs are able to uh, introduce some new gates, some more parameters, some more sort of fancy things to ensure that you can train the model well. But there is no clear understanding of why LSTMs and GRUs are able to train these models well. There is absolutely no understanding in general, A. And B, they need to introduce new parameters, new gates, which means that the cost of inference and cost of uh, like, you know, peak memory, uh, memory used by the model, all these go up. That is, uh, compared to a standard recurrent neural network, um, an LSTM is about four times more expensive in terms of model size as well as compute requirement. And a GRU will be about three times more expensive, which can be a deal breaker in, in a lot of these tiny devices setting. So the question that we asked was, can we come up with a new recurrent neural network architecture, which has exactly the same number of parameters as a standard recurrent neural network architecture, but is much easier to train and is sort of accurate. Right? And here we had a very, very simple idea. Uh, inspired by, like, I don't know, linear algebra, uh, or you can also say that it is inspired by residual networks, um, which is the following. So we call this new architecture fast RNN. Here, the idea is that you say apply standard recurrent neural network uh, uh, transformation like this, but rather than taking full step in that direction, I my new state will be a small step alpha in that direction and beta in uh, in my original direction right so what that essentially means is that when i get a new point i'm not going to completely sort of switch uh, gears and i will i'm not going to go to completely new uh, hidden state anymore i will uh, go to new hidden state very slowly that is most of the component of the new hidden state is essentially the old hidden state. And there's a small amount of modification that is being uh, uh, done by this new data point, right? So as to make these uh, hidden state switches much more smooth, which hopefully like it totally mean that uh, the gradient is also not going to explode. Okay, uh, does that, uh, is that clear? Uh, here note that like, you know, in general you would, presume that alpha plus beta is equal to one, that is you should take a convex combination. But in practice, we found out that if you allow alpha and beta to be arbitrary, that's, that helps. So now the trainable parameters that we have are the same as recurrent unit one, that is W and U, but with an addition of these two new parameters, alpha and beta, that is alpha and beta are also trainable parameters for us. And what we observe is that this sort of simple modification already ensures that uh, the model trains pretty well accuracy of this fast RNN model is significant higher than standard RNN. And in fact, it is fairly close to gated recurrent networks. But it is still about 1%, 2% lower. Uh, 
but what we can do is uh, like and just to sort of give you intuition why this works out if you write down the gradient of this whole thing then the gradients now eigen vectors uh, of my u matrix uh, <clears throat> or the of the gradient not u matrix have term like beta plus alpha uh, times some say largest eigen value of u to the power t and similarly beta minus alpha to the power t and what that essentially means is that let's say if beta is at a scale of 1 and alpha is at a scale of 1 by t then the largest eigen value is bounded by a constant and smallest eigen value is also bounded by a small constant that is i have both upper bound and lower bound on eigen values of the gradient here no matter how large the sequence size is if alpha that we learn turns out to be around 1 by t and beta that we learn turns out to be around 1 and what we observe in practice is that it, that indeed is the case that is like you know we do see that alpha and beta turns out to be around that size right uh, so now like you know as i was saying that um, uh, that this technique uh, this fast rnn technique is able to do fairly well it is able to get to accuracy which is very similar to gated rnn but it still it is like you know 1 to 2% worse so to sort of obtain and like you know to uh, to shore up that bit of accuracy also we use uh, one more trick which is that of adding gates here uh, but with shared parameters i will not go in detail here please look at our paper if you are more interested but what this really does is that um, we have pretty much the same number of parameters as your standard a uh, neural network uh, as your standard lstm sorry as your standard recurrent neural network architecture but now the accuracy of our model is very very similar to that of your standard gated rnn uh, architectures now on top of this uh, we can apply some standard compression techniques that is we can make uh, the matrices that we are learning w u to be low rank to be sparse to be quantized and if we ensure that the training regime is set properly if the training routine is set properly then we are able to train our model pretty well the model size is now very small in fact even smaller than rnn but our accuracies will be on par with that of standard uh, lstms and gis so to sort of make this point we have um, Uh, we have uh, uh, see some of these benchmark numbers. So here uh, we took uh, data sets from different sort of domains. So we took uh, some of these audio keyword uh, detection data sets called Google 12 and Google 30. We took some sentiment classification data set from NLP domain. We took some sport activity recognition data set from IM sensor domain, and we also took like you know some nominal data set from the image domain. Right, and here what we observe is that the proposed fast GRNN architecture that we have gets accuracy which is very similar to your GRU and LSTM. That is, you can see that this red bar's accuracy is very similar to this last two bars in each of these uh, models. But the the size of uh, fast GRNN can be twenty to eighty x smaller than a standard GRU and LSTM. Right, so so we have a fairly accurate model which can be twenty to eighty x smaller than a standard GRU and LSTM. that's the upshot here okay all right and now because our model size is so small you can actually go and deploy them on the tiny devices that we discussed right so you can actually go and deploy models on these m0 plus class device or these devices dot that are called arduino duo and here we observe that our models like the fast gerl model in terms of latency is very small it can be done locally uh, in few milliseconds whereas the latency for these existing models like uh, uh lstms and grus is very large because they don't even fit on these devices so you will need to send the data to cloud but even if you use some more like uh, recent techniques to optimize rnns better like ugr and spectral rnn even compared to that our models is and uh, like our latency is much much better all right so uh, i sort of you know described uh, at least a very high level about this other building block that we have called fast gerl so in the remaining like you know 15 minutes or so i will just discuss the final piece of work that we call rnn pool so this is sort of the most sort of new and shiny algorithm in our uh, in our toolkit and uh, this is uh, this is work that we recently presented as a spotlight at uh, neurips 2020 so so the 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 idea is that like you know rn pool is a general purpose pooling operator it can be applied to reduce the feature size or the feature map uh, that you have in a standard convolution network uh, significantly without uh, much loss in accuracy 
and we can show that it is able to provably reduce ram requirement compared to any standard cnn architecture that is you cannot sort of tweak your computation graph in some manner to provide better uh, ram requirement you will be able to uh, we can sort of provably say that if you do not use this pooling type of operator then you will require more than this much amount of ram uh, was there any ping or any uh, any question Okay, uh, and we evaluate uh, this technology on a variety of tasks like object classification, face recognition, product detection, and in each of these tasks, what we observe is that compared to standard uh, models in this regime, especially for tiny devices or like especially for say even mobile devices, we observe eight to ten x reduction in RAM requirement without a significant loss in accuracy, and that implies a two to five x improvement in compute also. Uh, well, that does not imply, but we can show that we can get two to five x improvement. In compute, so you might uh, ask, why do I care for computer vision on tiny devices? Well, again, there are a lot of settings like uh, 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 like retail stores or conference rooms or stadium where you would want to sort of do, do a processing locally on your camera and um, ensure that, like you know, you are able to do computer vision uh, analysis pretty well. Uh, especially because these cameras might be battery operated, or you might be worried about privacy of people, so you would want to do most of the processing. Okay. So, and as I said, that like the type of devices that you would be interested in is these, uh, say, Cortex M4 class devices, which have just about 256 kilobyte of RAM. Uh, all right. So, existing works in this domain uh, again falls in the model compression bit, and um, uh, here uh, you have to decrease, uh, like you know, I said that like you know, uh, one common approach is to uh, decrease the model size through pruning or sparsification, or you can try to decrease the amount of compute through some more like specific architectures like mobile network efficient net. But in most of these techniques, the peak RAM that we that the model requires that remains high because uh, the intermediate activation map tends to be very large even even after doing all these. And that means that uh, uh, that your models will still not be able to, still won't be deployable on these type of devices. For example, like you know, this M4 class device, uh, which is probably the biggest device that uh, that can be battery operated, right? And these type of devices have only about 256 kilobyte of RAM. So you have hard constraint on how much battery you can, sorry, uh, how much RAM you can consume. Right, you can consume say only about 256 kilobyte of RAM, and these existing techniques are not uh, effective in that sense. Right? So, why do uh, these convolution neural network require this large amount of uh, working memory? So, this is say a very standard resonator in architecture, right? So, here, like you know, as you sort of you take your in input image, you keep on applying filter, keep on refining the feature map, right? So, the intermediate layers tend to have um, uh, activation maps which are very large. That is. Let's say I took a uh, say 128 by 128 image. I apply some pooling, convolution, blah blah, and I. So there is another it. question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in general, we will also consider compute units in a tiny device. Do we use any tools to optimize the model according to device, or it doesn't matter? Good question. So uh, yes, like uh, there is some bit of work going on in uh, in having accelerators connected to these tiny devices also that is you can attach uh, some things called uh, uh, dsps these digital signal processing units uh, so those those units are are at least compared to a standard microcontroller much more efficient uh, like in terms of latency uh, in computing say matrix matrix multiplication so for example they can compute your convolutions much faster so yes, you would want to attach uh, DSP to your microcontroller to get better latency. But the peak RAM requirement uh, issue that is there in these tiny devices, that still remains. That is, uh, the standard convolutions techniques or these architectures will require large amount of RAM and uh, these tiny devices will not be able to support it. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, 
so as i was saying that like you know as you sort of uh, 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 refine your feature map through this architecture uh, some intermediate stages will have large activation maps so for example uh, after about uh, three or four layers in resnet 18 you have a activation map of size 56 by 56 by 64 and uh, that's fairly large you cannot sort of uh, put it in a tiny device now can you do something about it uh, one approach is that you decrease the number of channels here that is rather than 64 channels what if i use 32 channels only that's a good idea but it's known and it's sort of shown that uh, that would lead to a significant drop in accuracy right so what is the um, another approach another approach is that because ram is the key issue what if i completely skip this uh, this block that is i will I will not store this block at all. I will do my computation. I will set my computation graph so that I'm able to go from this layer to let's say this layer directly. So let's say the input layer is small and some uh, like two layer down the lane. Uh, again, the activation map is small and the intermediate layer, whatever computation um, I need to do, I will just keep on repeating that computation so that I don't have to do this storage of intermediate activation map. And this is a perfectly fine idea. but we can show that you will not be able to do that until unless you introduce a large amount of recompute and that means that again like you know because already you are worried about latency and the battery life of the device if you are uh, if you are introducing a lot more recompute then like those uh, those parameters will just go off the charts so you will need to store this large feature map if you don't want to incur a significantly more amount of compute now one approach that you can apply is that oh i can apply pooling before this layer so that this 56 by 56 image becomes say 20 by 28 by 28 image <coughs> and that's a perfectly good idea but it is known that standard pooling or strided convolution because they do very simplistic uh, aggregation they can lose a lot of information so that's why typically pooling is applied to only a feature map or a receptive field of size 2 by 2 you do not even apply it to 3 by 3 which right uh because it can it can lose so much accuracy right because pool, what does pooling do it just sort of so standard say max pool what it does is it looks at a 2 by 2 map and says that what is the maximum value in these four pixels i will just take that as my pixel value for this combination of four pixels so naturally it will lose uh, important information and that's why you cannot sort of pool more than say a 2 by 2 uh, uh, receptive field and that's where rnn pool comes in picture that is we are able to pool significantly larger uh, feature uh, like uh, patches so uh, or receptive field right that is what rnn pool does is like it can take say even 4 by 4 or even 8 by 8 patches and summarize it with say just one pixel that is it is able to pool 4 by 4 patch into one pixel and uh, then like you know you can use that as your new activation map and you can do whatever right so how do we apply like how do we really do this pooling so we are not able to, we are not doing some simple uh, max pooling or average pooling because they will load a lot of uh, lose a lot of energy so what we do is we take our say 4 by 4 patch we run uh, four recurrent neural networks on it and uh, that recurrent neural network that finally gives me a a pixel or a voxel uh, which is a very good summary of my data or this 4 by 4 patch right uh and uh, here to run this rnn uh, like, like this uh, rnn uh, operators obviously will be costly so that's why we use our fast jrnn block that we had earlier uh, discussed right because that fast jrnn block is fairly cheap so we can apply that here to ensure that the cost of this pooling operator is not too high in terms of say latency or compute right so that's sort of the basic idea so extremely simple idea what we are saying is we will take much larger receptive field we will run recurrent neural network on it uh, on say the rows of it columns of it and then do some sort of combination to have a summary of a very large patch with one small voxel itself and that means that now i can take a say 56 by 56 image and i can apply this sort of operation and i can maybe get it to just a 14 by 14 image right and that means that now i like even though the number of channel is somewhat large and i'm doing a lot of computation because ultimately the computation is done only on a 14 by 14 image so the cost of the compute is comes down the peak memory usage comes down so so it gives this significant advantages to us
So this is like a very sort of simple basic idea that we apply here. Now this rec uh, this pooling operator because it is symmetrically uh, like you know, similar to any standard pooling operator, you can apply it anywhere in the network architecture. But if you want to save the cost of like that is if you want to bring down the peak memory usage as well as compute, then you should ideally apply it at the beginning of the network. And if you want to get more accuracy, then you should apply it at the end of the architecture. So we have like you know several bit of uh, these uh, things that we do. That is here, for example, like if you take a resonant architecture, this intermediate activation map is really large. We cannot put it in a small device. But here, what we did was after this first layer itself, we apply a recurrent uh, this RNN pool layer, and that means that I went from this layer directly to a layer which is so small, like much smaller, like it is just a 28 by 28 by 192. Uh, activation map and on top of that when i am applying my rest of the dense net blocks they are like you know they are much much cheaper in terms of both ram as well as uh, compute okay so we compared our rn pool operator against some standard pooling operators we also sort of use it for some end-to-end -end task and see like you know how much uh, accuracy does it lose? Can it reduce compute requirement? Can it reduce re peak RAM requirement? So here we compare this RNN pool architecture against some standard techniques like average pooling, max pooling, standard convolution. And what we observe is that, like you know, compared to these uh, networks, we can get like you know, even for this very simple task of ImageNet 10, we see like two to three percent improvement, right? Uh, while ensuring that the peak RAM usage is same for all these pooling operators. Right. When you go to much more complicated tasks, like for example, on a phase detection task, then doing this max pooling, average pooling can actually bring down the accuracy by 10 to 15 percent, not just 2 to 3 percent. Uh, we can now also like you know use our technique to do to solve problems like visual vapor. That is, let's say you have some coffee machine. You walk in front of the coffee machine and you look at the coffee machine. So coffee machine figures out, oh, there is a person here uh, looking to do something. So it sort of wakes up the engine and says that, oh, like you know. Uh, do you want cappuccino or whatever, right? So, so this is this problem is called visual vapor. That is, it takes the image and it wants to sort of figure out if there is a person in the image or not, and based on that, wake up the system. So, uh, again, like you know, visual vapor typically you would de up deploy on like really really tiny microcontrollers, and what we are able to show is that we can get like you know state of the art accuracy with just about thirty two kilobyte of RAM. Right, and even in terms of compute, we can get about fifty percent saving in compute compared to standard uh, uh, standard techniques without losing accuracy. Right, so so that's sort of the upshot of our method here. And then finally, like you know, we can apply our method in uh, these complicated tasks like phase detection. Here, for example, we have a model which we can actually fit in just about 225 kilobyte of RAM. That is, we can actually put it on a microcontroller. And we show that it sort of, you know, at least in its class, it is able to get fairly high accuracy. Uh, so map is a measure of accuracy here. We can see that <coughs> compared to a competing method eagle eye in this regime, which is still like much more expensive, uh, like our method is like, you know, six to seven percent more accurate. Right? And it is able to do fairly decent job in identifying these cases. Now we can also use our model to do like, you know, do some more compression and we can actually uh, have a running example of uh, uh, phase detection and people detection uh, in conference room type of scenario. So there we have a end to end system uh, that you can demo uh, that requires 188 kilobyte of peak RAM. So it can be deployed like so that's why we have a M4 class device which has just 256 kilobyte of RAM and we have this model running on it. Uh, the model size is also very small. The total number of flops that we need is also fairly small and its accuracy is also fairly decent, fairly close to um, state of the art in this region. Great. And then like you know, similarly, we can use this uh, method for product detection. Here what we observe is that uh, our method <coughs> is like you know about 10 to 12 percent more accurate than standard YOLO V3 model while requiring about uh, 70 to 80x smaller amount of compute and about six times less RAM. And it is about eight times less accurate than your fast RCNN model. But these fast RCNN models are extremely expensive in terms of flops and as well as RAM. So you might not even be able to deploy them in many of your standard settings. Even in your mobile phone, you might not be able to deploy it because the amount of RAM, so the amount of compute that it needs is very high. Okay. All right. So let me just conclude. I'm over time here. 
so as I was trying to convince, resource aware machine learning is really critical if you want to deploy uh, machine learning and AI in real world, especially IoT and uh, uh, all these like you know uh, small sensors and microcontrollers provides very sort of high impact opportunity in this domain. And our uh, sort of approach in this sort of space has been to design new architectures, new building blocks from scratch that are designed precisely for these tiny devices. But these architectures, because they are natively small, they might be able to help you on mobile devices or your cloud uh, devices. And in particular, we came up like recently we came up with this technique called RNN tool, which is able to bring down peak ramp requirement of your standard convolution neural network by eight to ten x without significant loss in accuracy. So, so that's all I had to say in terms of my talk. Uh, as I mentioned, that like at the Google research, we are sort of setting up a new team. So, uh, so we are like you know very open to collaborations. We are looking for actively looking for uh, interns, uh, visiting researchers, visiting sort of student researchers, uh, pre-doctoral researchers. So these are people who like you know spend a year or two with us before going for this PhD. And this year's pre-doctoral cycle is over. But for next year, like definitely we are looking for applications. So we, if you're interested in collaborating, if you're interested in working with definitely uh, shoot me. So there's another question from Abhilash. Sure. Uh, how much data, let's say CV task is required in this domain? Uh, so we are sort of, you know, working in standard uh, training regimes here. That is, for example, uh, for this phase detection problem, uh, we use this wider phase data set, which I think has about 30 to 40,000 images. And I think uh, probably 100,000 or more than that faces. So, uh, and so, yeah, different problems have different sort of uh, data regime. This visual record, I think, is trained on much smaller number of images, probably, I think, two to 3,000 images. And uh, this image cl classification was on 10 classes only. So I think about 5,000 or 10,000 images were there. So we are like in exactly same data regime. We are not like whatever you use to train your standard model, say a mobile net V2 architecture or ResNet architecture, we are using exactly the same amount of data and training your architecture. Any other questions or comments or criticisms or discussion points? Now there, there seems to be no questions. Okay. So, just so you were saying about uh, the uh, team at uh, team at Google Research that was being set up, right? Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, can you come again? Yeah. So, uh, if uh, if anyone is interested in collaborating or you know applying to any of the positions you mentioned about, like how do we go okay. about that? Uh, so for collaboration or if you have some questions or some ideas to discuss, definitely shoot me an email. Again, I get a lot of emails, so sometimes I might not be able to respond very quickly, but uh, but some bit of persistence from you will definitely ensure a reply. Uh, uh, as for the pre-doctoral program, as I said, that this cycle is over. Uh, so for the next cycle, I think uh, you will see some sort of announcement maybe in October, November time frame. Uh, for research interns, again, this summer, I think we might be full, but feel free to send an email to me or I think on our career site, on Google Research India's career site, you, you might be able to sort of find the link for applying for internship. And uh, yeah, and if you want to sort of you know visit us for some longer term, so like say for example for one entire semester, again feel free to send me an email, and uh, if there is a good fit, then definitely like you know we'll try to pursue it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, uh, there seems to be one more question actually. Um, sure. Uh, is incremental learning possible? Can a tiny model learn using present incremental learning techniques um see like frankly speaking i've never really tried it in that regime so can't say for certainty but uh, 
but in general the way we train our models is very similar to standard uh, model training so it is a very good incremental training model that is able to train the standard cloud models or standard like you know, large models then these tiny models also should be trainable but but don't sort of quote me on that uh, uh, like in many cases like you might have to try it and see if it works out. any other questions yeah there seems to be one more question for mm -hmm. tasks like reinforcement learning where the models continuously learn in the environment how would a mm -hmm. tiny device fare yeah so that's a great question and uh, that's one again application area where uh, i feel there is a lot more sort of you know uh, like there is, like there, like it's a completely open problem in some sense and it is an important problem now these devices in general are going to be very tiny so i don't think you will be able to run your training completely locally but certain things like federated learning can be used but here like just federated learning might also not be enough so we'll need to figure out a way to ensure that because the goal of federated learning in general is slightly orthogonal so here in this regime we will need to come up with some solution which is able to leverage the communication between say cloud or your like you know gateway devices and your tiny devices in a much more meaningful manner that is let's say some part of the gradient might be computed and updated on the device whereas some other part of the gradient which is much more expensive might need to be computed on the device so if you have large architecture maybe first few layers you try to train uh, on locally on the device and if you do not see improvement or if you see that things are making getting worse then you send ship it some part of your data and some part of your uh, parameter space to the cloud and ask cloud to train that so it's like some some sort of collaborative scheme between cloud and tiny devices but uh, i feel it's a very interesting direction and a fairly important question any other questions All right. Okay, so thanks a lot for attending the talk. And definitely, if you have any questions about the talk, feel free to write to me. I'm happy to answer them all. And do like look at our papers if you want to go in more detail. All right. Sure. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Uh, I think a lot of us got to learn a lot from this talk as well. And yeah. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Bye. All right. Uh, so um, we'll be ending this session right now. And uh, yeah, thank you.